from there to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, good to see you all here. I hope that uh, you're planning on staying with us. Today is what has been affectionately coined as Super Sunday because of all the proceedings that go on. Our fellowship meal, our 1.30 service, and then going out to Pilate and worshiping with them at 6 o'clock. And so I'm looking, I always look forward to these days, and I hope you do too, and take advantage of all the opportunities that you have to, to not only worship God, but to be with one another. And so as we are in Acts chapter 2, I started this series last week, something that's been on my mind for quite some time, doing a series on the Church of Christ. And one, well, what we talked about last week was this idea of sectarianism. We talked about the church unified last week. Today we're going to talk about the church prophesied. What do we mean by the church unified? Well, you guys know just as well as I do, the religious world is not that. It is not unified in any sense of the term. It's divided. But I don't like the word division because division is sometimes called for, isn't it? We talked about that last week. God, in fact, demands division at times. Um, We looked at Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Mark those who teach things that are contrary to the doctrine and avoid them. Well, what is that? That's division. The right term to use when we're talking about the division that exists in the religious world is sectarianism. It's an attachment to a particular sect or party, especially in religion. That's the right word. And we looked at several verses, 1 Corinthians 1, and I love 1 Corinthians 1.10. Be of the same mind, be of the same judgment, speak the same thing. There should be no divisions among you. And yet, what do you see? You see division. Why is that? We we looked at why are there divisions? Well, it could be family tradition, it could be a bad interpretation of Scripture, Uh, it could be ignorance. We looked at a lot of different things that can cause religious division. But the fact of the matter is this you and I have the revealed will of God. And if we know it and we are dedicated to truth above sect or truth above party, then there would be no division because it's commanded. I mean, unity within the body of Christ is commanded, but then it's prayed for by Jesus Himself. If it is not attainable, if that unity is not attainable, then why is it prayed for by the Son of God and commanded by the apostles of the Son of God? Unity is absolutely achievable. We just have to be more dedicated to unity than we do ourselves and our own beliefs and opinions, etc. So division, again, division is not the right word to use. Here's what I want us to talk about today. I want us to talk about prophecy. Well, what is prophecy? Here's the technical definition. It's a prediction. It's a declaration, an exhortation, a warning. You've got your Old Testament prophets. You've got your New Testament prophets, don't you? Sometimes they foretold. Sometimes, in other words, they told events events that would take place in the future. Sometimes a fairly immediate future. I think of the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, talking about Babylonian captivity and things like this. Sometimes maybe within within a few days. But then you've got other prophecies that are hundreds and hundreds of years in advance of the fulfillment. And that's actually what we're going to talk about today. A prophet is a spokesman, one who is raised up by God, who proclaims His Word, but also one who tells future events. Biblical prophecy includes both of those, um, both of those angles, let's say. Let's, let's just look at this real quick. Turn over to Exodus chapter 7. I want to look at, we're not going to look at all of these verses, but I do want to look at Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. This is the context of uh, Moses and Aaron going before Pharaoh and demanding that God's people be released from Egyptian captivity. God says to Moses, you're like God unto Pharaoh. That's that's going to be his perception of you, and Aaron's going to be your prophet. Well, Aaron's the mouthpiece, isn't he? That's what a prophet is. Because what was one of Moses' excuse back in uh, Exodus chapter 4? Well, listen, I'm not very eloquent. I I don't speak well. The way we might say that, I don't talk right. I don't speak well. Well, Aaron will go with you. He will be a prophet. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. This may be one of the most significant passages in all of Scripture to help us understand what a prophet is and what his task was. Deuteronomy 18, beginning in verse 17. Listen to what the Bible says here. 
The Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like unto you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth. There's the mouthpiece idea. And he shall speak to them all that I have commanded him. And it shall be that whosoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, presume, he take, he's taken it upon himself, he's speaking presumptuously, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word the Lord has not spoken? How can you tell the difference between genuine God-originating prophecy and the charlatans that are out there? Those who claim to be prophets. Here it is. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen nor come to pass, that thing is not what the Lord has spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. That's the difference. Or that's the, you might say, the test of a prophet. That particular section has been called the test of a prophet. He speaks something, it doesn't come to pass. That did not come from the Lord. He's spoken it out of his own authority. Jeremiah chapter 26, verses 1 and 2. Same idea there. We get to the New Testament, and the New Testament talks about prophets as well. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 20, the Bible tells us that the church was established upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So prophecy is a prominent work, let's say, in the first century church. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37, Paul writes, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. There you go. A true prophet will know. And those who are hearing will know whether or not it's a true prophet. Let's look at one more passage. In this particular passage, on this section, this particular passage is extremely important for grasping what we're going to talk about today. Have you ever wondered, you, maybe you've got a Bible reading schedule and you're reading through your Old Testament. Have you ever wondered when, they are pro, when those old, old Testament men are prophesying of maybe it's the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, like Isaiah 53, the establishment of the church, have you ever wondered, I wonder if they really got it. I wonder if those men really comprehended what they were saying. Peter answers that question for us here. He's talking about the persecution that these Christians are enduring and the salvation that comes at the end if they remain faithful. And that's where verse 9 is. Receiving the end of your faith, that is, the salvation of your souls. You know, you maintain your faith even through difficult times, then the, you have that eternal salvation. But then he says this, of which salvation? The eternity with God, the, the be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life, that from that aspect of salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Who, pro who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you? Notice that. They were prophesying of the grace that would come to you. He's talking to first century Christians here. Back years ago, they were talking about stuff that, that didn't necessarily apply to them in that time. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The Old Testament prophets talked of all of that. Unto whom it was revealed. God revealed it to those men. They spoke it. Yet not to themselves. What they spoke wasn't just for them. But unto us they did minister those things, which are now reported unto you by them who have the Holy... By, uh, by those who have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So if you're reading through your Old Testament and you're wondering, did those prophets really grasp it? This text tells me they didn't. They didn't fully understand it. In fact, verse 10 uses this word inquired. They investigated. They looked into it deeply. They wanted to know exactly what they were talking about, but they didn't live to see the fulfillment. They knew they were speaking God's Word. They searched, verse 10. They thoroughly sought out. One of the, this was an interesting analogy, an analogy that the, 
the Greek dictionary used for that word searched out was that of a hunting dog, a dog on the trail. And you know how they will hunt out a scent. That's how diligently these prophets wanted to know, wanted to fully understand and perhaps see the fulfillment of what they were talking about. They were examining into these things. But you and I live in a time where their message is now fully revealed. And it's fully revealed because of the work of the Holy Spirit. All of these, and there are many others by the way, but all of these passages tell me that a prophet is a spokesman, one who was raised up by God, who could proclaim His Word, and one who tells future events. And they, again, particularly your Old Testament prophets, didn't have a full grasp of everything they were saying. Let's talk about the church of Christ being prophesied. I said this last week, and I will always stand by this statement, and I've said it many times. There's only one church that has the right to exist by God's authority. All the division, all the error that's taught does not exist because of God's authority, because of God's will. That is not His will. It is not God's will that people be deceived or that people be ignorant. I mean, that's why we have His Word. The Old Testament is full of prophecies that talk about this kingdom that would be established. What we're going to do today, though, is we're going to stay in Acts chapter 2. And the re here's the way I want to, I'm going to address these other prophecies as we go through this series, but the church starts in Acts 2, doesn't it? You've heard me say this, the word church is only used three times in the gospel accounts, only by Matthew, once when Jesus promised to build His church in Matthew 16, 18, and then the other two times is in Matthew 18 when, when the process of church discipline is being applied and you take it before the church. Those are the only times the, gospel uses, the gospels use that word. And you don't read that word church again until you get to Acts chapter 2 when people are actually being added to it. Jesus promised it, so it's future, Matthew 16, but then people are being added to it in Acts 2. So somewhere between those two statements, the church has been established. That's what's going on in Acts chapter 2. There are four prophecies that are specifically listed here in Acts chapter 2 that I want us to take time to look at. Jerry was asking me, are you sure you're... Scripture reading ends at verse 16. I was like, yeah, it's a cliffhanger. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Well, what was spoken by Joel? If you, can, if you were to continue reading there in Acts chapter 2, if that's where you have your Bible, it shall come to pass in the last days. If you were here for Bible class, remember we talked about the last hour? Same period of time. The last days. I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see visions. Uh, your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And my, on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. I want you to notice this now. This is the second time, if you're following along in the text, that it said this. It doesn't say, I will pour out my spirit. What does it say? I will pour out of my spirit. This is power that's happening, power that's coming from the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. <coughs> the day on which the church was established. And I've got the, the text reference here for you in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. You got, these guys are drunk. That was the charge that was made. No, what you're witnessing is the outpouring from the Holy Spirit. This is power. This is of the Spirit. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. If you've read your Old Testament prophets, you've read that language before. Prophetic of the establishment of something in the future. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The book of Joel, from which Paul is... Uh, Peter is quoting here in Acts chapter 2, was written approximately 800 years before the birth of Christ. And it was written during a time of national trouble, national sin, God's people were being punished, but it's in the midst of those pronouncements of judgment that this prophecy comes in. There's a time coming when power is going to be manifested from the Holy Spirit and salvation will be made available. So when the charge came from the people in Jerusalem, hey, these guys are drunk or something, no. What you're seeing and what you're hearing 
is that which was prophesied by Joel. And I, in fact, I'll tell you one of the most important verses in Acts chapter 2, because a lot of people still claim the miraculous, don't they? They claim the ability to speak in tongues. They claim the ability to heal and all of these different things. Look at Acts chapter 2 a little bit later on in the text and get down to verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received the, uh, from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Here's your important part of this verse. He has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. What could they see? If you go back to the first four verses of Acts chapter 2, when the apostles are baptized in the Holy Spirit, when this power is poured forth from the Holy Spirit, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Isn't that what the text says? There appeared unto... There was something visible that the people that day could see. And then look at the end of verse 4. <clears throat> and they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Those were things they could hear. So connect Acts 2.33 with Acts 2 verses 1 through 4. God hath poured forth this, which you now see and hear. That prophecy of 800 years before the birth of Christ is being fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 in regards specifically, again to verse 21, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Because how did Peter's sermon end here in Acts chapter 2? Men and brethren, what shall we do? They wanted to know because they had just been condemned by Peter for crucifying Christ. What do we, how do we fix this? Well, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What was Peter's instruction based on their question in Acts 2.38? Let's just call on the name of the Lord. Look at it. Is that what verse 38 says? Because that's what we're told today. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Just call on the name of the Lord. Just say this prayer. That's not what it says. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Because whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's the command, repent and be baptized, purpose for the remission of sins, and then there's a promise given to them, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Fulfilled prophecy. You get down to verse 41. Those that gladly received His word were baptized. And the same day there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. What does that mean, added unto them? Look at verse 47. The Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. First time you read the church, the word church after the Gospel of Matthew. Now the church is a reality. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel 2, 28-32 is about that manifestation of the power from the Holy Spirit, the speaking in tongues. The people heard that. They were convinced of their sin, and they called on the name of the Lord. And Peter said, here's what you do. And 3,000 people were saved that day. Same chapter. Acts 2, beginning in verse 25. For David speaks concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in the grave. Hell is not the right word here. You know, there are actually people who teach that Jesus, when He died, He went to hell and, and gave those people who were in hell a second chance to hear the gospel and believe. His, his body was not left in the grave. Verse 27. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Jesus in the tomb did not decay. Do you remember when Lazarus died in John chapter 11? Jesus heard that he was sick. And the Bible says that he tarried a couple of days. And then they went. But, but in the meantime, Lazarus died. And then when they get there, they said, Jesus said, let's go. Let's go to see him. You remember what was said? Lord, by now he stinks. It's been four days. He stinks by now. He's starting to decompose. Acts 2.27, Jesus didn't see corruption. His body didn't begin that process like Lazarus's did. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy 
with thy countenance. And then Peter gets back to the audience in verse 20. Men and brethren, he's not speaking about David because David's right here with us. That's a quote, by the way, of Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, which is approximately a thousand years before the birth of Christ. What's my point? What's the point here? The point is this. Here's another prophecy that's connected with the establishment of the church, but the direct link is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you remember Jesus' promise to build the church? I will build my church and the, the gates of Hades, my death is not going to prevent it. This is it. You might even connect Acts 2, 25 to 28 with the end of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus' death did not prevent the establishment of His church, which is the kingdom. Matthew 16, verse 19. Men and brethren, let me speak, freely speak unto you of David. He is both dead and buried, and we know where his tomb is. We can go look at his body right now, because that's not who that passage was talking about in Psalm 16. Prophecy number two fulfilled on the day that was, that, uh, on which the church was established. Verse 30, still speaking of David, therefore being a what? What's David called here? A prophet. And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, the oath to him is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. That's why I have that up there. That of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in the grave, and his flesh didn't see corruption. Okay, Peter, so what? This Jesus hath God raised up, of where we are, whereof we are all witnesses. Prophecy number three, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and applied to the establishment of the church. I will build my church and my death will not prevent it from happening. Matthew 16, verse 18. The, third, the fourth and final prophecy is in Acts 2, verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens. Remember, his body's right here. Isn't that what he said in verse, what verse? 29? David is not ascended into the heavens. But he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes Thy footstool, that's a quote from Psalm 110 and verse 1. These, so these last three prophecies are all approximately a thousand years before the birth of Jesus, and they are all in direct connection with the, uh, with the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, here's the thing, guys, you need to understand. If the resurrection of Christ is a farce, if that's just some... Um, what's the word I'm trying to look for? If it's just some metaphor for for the new life that people experience in Christ, then the entire church system is a fraud. We are absolutely wasting all of our time right now. Because if he's still dead, if he's still in the grave, well, just read 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to, 12 to 19. We are without hope. We're still in our sins. We're liars. We're more miserable than any people on the, on the earth. The entire Christian system either stands or falls with the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's the point that's made three times in Acts chapter 2. We often focus on other prophecies, again, which we are going to do, and which are extremely significant. Uh, I think of Daniel chapter 2, I think of Isaiah chapter 2, but <clears throat> you look at the Psalms and then 2 Samuel chapter 7, the connections with David, the connections, the promises with the throne of David and the resurrection of Christ from the dead, the church wouldn't exist if it were not for that. That's why it's so important to understand what Matthew 16, 18 say, means when it says, I will build my church and my death will not prevent it from happening. He died, he was buried, and he was raised from the dead. Just as was prophesied through the Psalms at least twice, and there, there are other Psalms, by the way, where that's recorded, but also in 2 Samuel chapter 7. All right? You guys know me. So what? What's the point? When you are in Acts chapter 2, and you read those verses that I've already looked at, men and brethren, what shall we do? Remember, whosoever, verse 21, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Well, you need to repent. And every one of you needs to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you and to your children and all to her afar off, even unto as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted, saying, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. And those that gladly heard his word were baptized. It's just a, and you guys have heard me talk about this, the, the text, it's just continuous, isn't it? You have what Peter says, but then you have what happens after the people do what Peter says. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. Why were they baptized? Because he said, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Were added unto them, and that same day there were about 3,000. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then it talks, beginning in verse 44 down through verse 46, how that early church, that infant church, as we might refer to it, takes, took care of one another. They had needs. And that continues throughout the book of Acts, doesn't it? You see the church coming together to meet needs and to, to help those who are lacking. While they're doing all of that, verse 47 says that they, the church, is praising God, and they had favor with all the people. The community around them, specifically at this point in time, Jerusalem, saw this. And they, they're witnessing how the church behaves in a, in a community. And so the church had favor with the people because of that. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Okay? Fast forward 2,000 years. And you have every brand of Christianity you can find. Anything you could imagine in terms of church that you want. I don't know how many times I've said this, and you guys may be tired of hearing me say it, but um, I'm going to say it anyway. When you, if, if you were to go to those people on that day, think about it like this. You've heard me say this many times. If you were to approach the people on that day when the church was established, and you were to ask them the question, what church did you join? They would have no idea how to answer that question. Because there were no options. There wasn't, well, we tried this church out for a little bit, and it was okay, but you know, hey, they didn't have a piano. And so the singing was a little bit boring. So we went on down the road a little bit, and we found this church, and we just fit better. There were no options. And, and knowing the, the, the evolution of church history, there were no options really until about the 11th century when you have the great schism between the East and the West, Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Okay, so now the, church, now, now the options diverge a little bit. And then you move about 500 more years into the future with John Wesley and John Calvin and what we call the Reformers, Martin Luther. And you have an explosion, a multiplicity of what now becomes known as Protestant denominationalism. Now you can find whatever you want. And move 500 years forward from there to us today, you now have the community church movement, which they try to remain independent of any overarching hierarchical structure of denominational bodies, conferences, alliances, they just want to be a community church, that it's a self-governing body. You can, ha you, have, you can have anything you want in church today. But when you go to the New Testament and you see these prophecies being fulfilled, these men who were the mouthpieces of God, who were speaking forth what God said, but also foretelling future events, you only read of one church. Jesus promised to build one church. He purchased that church with His blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. He's the head of the church and He's the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. I don't, I just, I'll just be honest. I don't know how do you... How could we go back to one church? I don't know that it's possible at this point. Because it, the, the religious world is so fragmented. It's so splintered. And people are more devoted to their traditions and their personal experiences than they are the truth. And that's a major problem too. If you're more devoted to those things than you are to finding out what God actually wants from His Word, 
you're not going to be able to achieve unity. But that's one of the things that the church of Christ is known for is, let's just go back to the Bible. I don't need the Westminster Confession of Faith. I don't need the catechisms. I don't need all of these historically man-made church documents to guide my faith and practice. Do you really believe what 2 Peter 1.3 says? That God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness? Because if you do, then Scripture is enough. I had somebody trying to explain to me the other day that, well, how do you know you're right? That's why we have the church councils and all these ancient church documents. His description was, well, those things serve as, those things serve as guardrails in your faith. Those things are not guardrails. Those are additions to Scripture. Scripture is the guideline, not what groups of men have met together and talked about and debated for 500 years. Scripture is the guideline. And Scripture tells me that this church that was established on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ was established based on the promise that Jesus made. It was on that day that it came to pass that Joel said, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you see what that looks like when Peter answers their question of what shall we do. The prophets pointed to that. And as man typically does, and in fact, as the New Testament warns, so many have departed from Scripture to go to their own well, to do their own will. Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. He talks about the way the King James renders it, it calls it self-imposed religion. The, new, the King James calls it will worship. That's the problem. People do things the way they want to do them, and then they'll claim, well, it's being done in the name of Christ. Do you remember what Jesus said about that in Matthew 7? Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's only one church that has a divine right to exist, folks. And it was prophesied throughout your, New, throughout your Old Testament. And we see it fulfilled with four specific prophecies in Acts chapter 2. You can be a member of that church today. You don't have to denominate yourself. You don't have to be a hyphenated Christian. In fact, you can't be. No name comes before the name of Christ. There's no other name. Look, if you're there in Acts 2, turn over a page to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of Christ. That's it. Are you a member of His church that He promised to, to, that he promised to build of which the, prop, the apostles and prophets of the first century are the foundation, Ephesians 2.20, that the Old Testament prophesies of? How do you become a member of that church? Well, you can't join it. You can't go out searching, searching among all the different types of churches that exist and say, I'll join this one, and eh, I'm not crazy about it, I'll go over here, I'll leave this one, I'll go over here and join this. That's not how it works. You don't join Christ's church. You are added to Christ's church when you have an honest desire to be saved from your sin and you submit to His will. And then He adds you to the church. God does that. You don't do that. The preacher doesn't do that for you. God adds you to the church. It's only when you obey the gospel. And it's not hard. That's the thing. There's no. I was studying with someone recently and explaining the differences in churches. Some churches that if you want to become a member, they've got to take a vote among the membership. And you've got to pass a two-thirds vote. It, I mean, that's... Have you ever thought about that in terms of there's no partiality with God? How many times does the Bible say that? There's no partiality with God, but listen, if you want to join our church, we're going to take a vote on you. So, who's God then? Anyway, if you want to be a member of the Lord's church, you can be a member of the Lord's church, just like they became members of the Lord's church in the first century. Men and brethren, what shall we do? You need to repent. Change your mind. And every one of you who wants to, to become just a, just a Christian... I don't have to have the burdens of, of Protestant denominationalism. I don't have to have all the names and the documents. I can just be a Christian. 
Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And those who gladly received that word were baptized, and you'll be added to the church. If that's your desire today to just be a Christian, we'll be happy to talk with you more, help you in that desire. Maybe you're here this morning and you've obeyed the gospel in the past, but you've not remained faithful. Think about what you're doing. The Bible tells me that the church is the eternal purpose of God. What you are doing if you become unfaithful to the Lord's church is you are turning your back on the eternal purpose of God. And you're turning your back on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. You need to come back. And if we can help you, if you need the prayers of the church, if there's sin in your life, whatever the case may be, we are here for you. We'll do whatever we can to help you.